Today we're going to look at the James White Jeff Riddle debate and start to talk about textual criticism. Welcome to Apologetics from the Attic, the show that seeks to teach and defend the Christian faith in a post Christian culture. And now, broadcasting from an attic, in an undisclosed location somewhere outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Here is your host, Dave Lewis. Hey, welcome to this episode of Apologetics from the Attic. So today, I wanted to start to cover two issues, and I'm trying to blend two things together. So, if you've never heard of textual criticism or what textual criticism is, uh, I want to start introducing the topic to you. I myself am a, I might be close to being intermediate in my knowledge of it. I'm certainly not an expert. Um, I'm certainly not a beginner either, but uh, anyway, we'll talk about that. But I want to introduce you to, to the topic, but I also want to do it with a little bit of flair because, so you're in on the latest. I want to look at some clips from James White and Jeff Riddle's debate that happened last weekend on the issue of the Textus Receptus versus the critical to critical text and I'll try to walk you through this so I think it'll be cool you, you listen to the debate and if you are new to this you won't have any idea about half of what they're talking about but I want to pause it and then we're going to intersperse some readings and some some learning some basic learning about what textual criticism is so, as with any debate, of course you want to listen to the whole debate, but the real meat of a debate is the cross-examination. So this is the first debate, and this debate is on the longer ending of Mark. So if you're new to this, if you open your Bible, if you have anything other than the King James Version, and you open to the Gospel of Mark, okay, and open up your Bible to the Gospel of Mark, and look at Mark 16, you will see that in most translations that are that are available today there will be a note in there that will tell you that mark 16 9 and following here's this little esv i have it says some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16 9 to 20. okay so they're debating does is 16 9 to 20 original or not did, the, did, did Mark's gospel contain this originally when it was first written or not? Now, we're going to see this debate gets a little more complicated. But So I'm going to start the cross-examination and try to explain what's going on. This might be difficult to do, but I figure, you know, it's good to just jump right in. Let's just jump right in the deep end here. And then at some point during this, this episode, I'll stop and we're going, to, we're going to read some selections from Metzger. Uh, which is, this is really the book, The Text of the New Testament by Metzger. We're going to read uh, large portions of it, just so, you know, you can get a, a, a sense of this. And, you know, for, for people my age and younger, I'm 38, um, it, me reading this to you while you're listening on a podcast or, or watching, um, you, that's the only way you're going to get into this type of book, which I'm the same way. So try to provide that for you. All right, let's listen to what, so James White got the first round of questioning of Dr. Riddle. And I'm sorry, uh, you know, and, and I think Dr. Riddle will probably admit this. He's new to debating. James White is just a complete monster in debates. He just is. I mean, I would not want to be cross-examined by James White ever. But anyway. Well, I want to be a man of my words. So, Dr. Riddle, um, if the external evidence were the exact opposite of what it is right now, uh, would that change your perspective on the longer ending of Mark? So the external evidence, what's that refer to? Well, when we're talking about manuscripts, so I'm trying to be as basic as possible. You have your English translation, right, of the New Testament, let's say, that's contained in this ESV Bible. Well, we all know, right, the Bible wasn't written in English, right? Everyone knows that. It was written in Koine Greek. And it was written at some point, in time, the original letter, the original gospel, on a piece of papyri, which was a leaf that was grown near the rivers in the, in the Middle East, and you'd press it together and turn it into a piece of paper. 
that was written there. Now, we do not have the original copy. So we have to go back and find copies of that original because it was, it was copied. It was copied right away. So Paul wrote a letter to the Romans. That letter was delivered to the Roman church. Then it was copied by other Christians to pass on to other churches. Same thing with the Gospels. And we are, textual criticism is finding copies of those things, okay? And external evidence is, let's compare the copies with one another. The actual physical copies that, are been, that have been discovered, copies of manuscripts. And here's a Nestle Allen 20, this is the 27th edition, I'm behind the times here. There's a 28th edition. But what's really cool, so this is the Greek New Testament, okay? in Greek. In the back, there is a listing of every single manuscript that has been, that is cataloged. I don't know if you can see that in these columns. And it tells you what portions of scripture it contains and where they are located in the world, like what museum, what uh, library. It's pretty cool. So that's what we're talking about, external evidence. So James White just basically asked Jeff Riddle, okay, if the external evidence was the opposite meaning that there's zero evidence that Mark, the long grinding of Mark, is original. Would he change his position? And we'll see why James is, is going this line of questioning. James is very good at cross-examination. Okay, He understands that cross-examination is to get your opponent to admit their inconsistencies almost without knowing it. And then in his closing statement, he will draw from what they said in their cross-examination to just put the death nail in them in the debate. He's very good at it. Well, I mean, again, I'm not crazy about hypothetical questions because we, we really can't take hypothetical questions. What, what, if, what if I said, I want to ask you a hypothetical question. What if we found a copy of the Ten Commandments that didn't have... Uh, the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Would it be okay to commit adultery then? Well, we would say no, because that would, whatever you found was going to be a violation of the moral law of God that's revealed in Scripture. And so if I, if I hold, as did, I, I think, the, um, the particular Baptist forebears, the Westminster divines, that the Scriptures that, that, that they had and that were in the printed form, the copies that were printed in, in their time, that those those uh, those opographs, those copies, were the autographs, and so if you tell me that you find a manuscript that contradicts what is the word of, I think James is reaching for his Textus Receptus to, to to respond to that, but there's a lot going on here. So the autograph, what is an autograph? The autograph is the technical term for the er original writing of a particular let's talk about new testament new testament book so when paul um and why can i never remember so paul had a scribe writing out his book someone writing stenographer writing while he talked that original copy of the book of romans is the autograph and we believe that was directly inspired by god the apograph i'm still trying to figure out what that is but in, in, in Dr. Riddle and his group, they're, they're, the apograph seems to be a, a collation, a copy of the, the manuscripts put into a text, like, you know, like a book, that is authorized by the church. So their thing is the Texas Receptus, which if you don't know what that is yet, well, we're about to talk about it. The Texas Receptus for this group, the, the, it's either called the Confessional Text Position, Providential Eclecticism, we'll talk about all these terms, is the text that, and James White really hammers them on this, They base their position basically is God re-inspired the writing of the Greek New Testament in during the period of the Reformation. And the Textus Receptus is the artifact of that divinely re-inspired text it's it's like king james onlyism and actually this is how i got familiar with dr white i mean my first introduction to dr james white was in 2002 when i was dealing with an individual who fell into king james onlyism 
and the internet was still pretty new. Weren't a lot of websites out there, weren't a lot of things, but somehow I stumbled upon, oh, I didn't bring that Bible, my NIV Bible that I have downstairs that I've had for, for a long time now, 20 years. Um, I, I had, it, it, was, it was James White debating uh, Thomas Holland on King James. And I have post-it notes on the inside of my NIV Bible that are still there. I haven't removed them where I'm going down the arguments of Thomas Hall and going through the arguments of James White. So anyway, uh, let's continue. God, I would say no, it would not change my, my opinion, my position on that. Because okay, so, the word so of God Riddle is settled. Is this the autograph, sir? The autograph, I, I, I would say that I agree with the Trinitarian Bible Society statement on the doctrine of Scripture. And we're in, uh, they suggest a group of printed texts of the Texas Receptus. But I think, I don't, I can't see what you're holding up. That's what is the it? Trinitarian Bible Society TR. Okay. Um, I, I think that the, the Scrivener's uh, edition of the TR is an excellent one. But like the Trinitarian Bible Society, I would appeal to the group of reformed um, printings of the TR from the Reformation era as the standard for what scripture is the protestant standard for scripture okay so he so james white's basically asking so where is the text of the new testament to be found uh and he held up a texas receptus and is this the autograph and jeff riddle doesn't he doesn't say yes it's the autograph but he he basically does answer yes he's well i'd add a couple other texts the texts the text of the greek new testament that was printed okay during the time of the reformation so here's where we're going to pause the debate and do some reading so this book is the text of the new testament by bruce metzger it's transmission corruption and restoration second edition this is an older edition so what is the textus receptus so let's do some study i'm going to move dr white and dr riddle over here and try to map this out for you if you're a beginner because i've noticed that um you know and james white i'll link to this he has an excellent presentation on this topic he does it's a he's got good powerpoints and everything um so what was what was the invention that changed the entire dynamic of how written texts were passed down and transmitted from generation to generation the gutenberg printing press the printing press and what was the first book printed on gutenberg's groundbreaking invention the printing press which by the way let's back up before the printing press right how did you pass down books you had to copy them by hand okay you had to hand copy books so you had to have one copy in front of you and you're sitting there and you're you're writing back and forth now to overcome this they have what was called scriptoriums where you would have dozens of scribes and one person who was reading the text up front and he'd read one line and all the scribes would copy the line and then there would be someone that would go around and check to make sure all the copies were consistent so there were ways to pump out more than one copy of, of of a text but that was the way you had to do it what was the printing press well the printing press was the invention of basically a plate where you could put font where you could put letters basically right and put them in order and like put out a, a page of text of of words and sentences and paragraphs put the ink on it and smash it down on the page and it prints a page now that was still a very laborious task but it revolutionized everything what was the first thing he printed well it was a bible and what was the bible that was printed it was the latin vulgate it was the latin vulgate jerome's latin vulgate so you gotta understand during this time so gutenberg's bible was printed between 1450 and 1455 and remember when was the reformation the reformation the official start of it was 1517, uh, when Luther nailed the 95 Theses, as far as historians go. Um, it's kind of a, a you know, a, a randomly chosen date in terms of, you could say there was a lot of stuff that happened before that brought about the Reformation. But anyway, so um, the Gutenberg Bible was the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate, so the Latin Vulgate was produced when? In the 400s? 
by Jerome, who's a church father, who translated the Hebrew and the Greek into Latin. So there's one copy that's translated from the original languages into another language, Latin. So during that time of the Gutenberg Press and the Gutenberg Bible, it would be like, you know, we're walking around with English translations, right? And we say, well, this is the Bible that we read. We're, we're America, English-speaking people in the United States of America. Well, of course, there was a text behind this, okay? But the Latin Vulgate reigned supreme in terms of the text. The Roman Catholic Church proper even taught that Jerome's work was inspired by God. And the Latin Vulgate had preeminence not only because it was just used for a long time, it was also viewed to have divine, uh, you know, a divine backing, which is similar to what they talk about the Texas Receptus. And then just check this out, a little fun fact. Uh, let me read this. Little, this is the GutenbergBible.com, the history of it. Between 1450, the Gutenberg Bi 55, the Gutenberg Bible was completed. Early documentation states that a total of 200 copies were scheduled to be printed on rag, cotton, linen paper, and 30 copies on vellum and animal, animal skin. It is not known exactly how many copies were actually printed. Today, only 22 copies are known to exist, of which seven are on vellum. If an entire Gutenberg Bible should become available on the world market, it would likely fetch an estimated $100 million. So you want to make your fortune? Go find one of those Gutenberg Bibles that is tucked away in someone's attic. Anyway, even an individual leaf, a single two-sided page from the original Gutenberg Bible, can fetch around $100,000. Gutenberg's work is the most rare and valuable printed material in the world. So that's what changed this. Okay, so let's. I'm skipping it a little bit here because there's some stuff. Uh, but the Complutensian polyglot, okay... So then, so before this time, right, um, you had, so, so people wanted to say, okay, since we can print books now, this is pretty cool. So since we can pump out books very in, more inexpensively and easily, I would like in my hand a bound copy of the Greek and Hebrew that underlie the text of the Latin Vulgate. I would like that. I would like to have that. Well, the first one that was actually printed was one, it was called the Complutensian polyglot. Okay, the Complutensian polyglot. And what was the Complutensian polyglot? Um, it was. The four volumes which contain the Old Testament present the Hebrew text, the Latin Vulgate, and the Greek Septuagint in three columns side by side on each page, together with the foot, the Aramaic Targum of Oclinus for the Pentateuch at the foot of the page accompanied by a Latin translation. The Greek type used in the New Testament volume is modeled after the style of the handwriting of manuscripts about the 11th to 12th century. It's very bold and elegant. And then they have a, a picture there. Um, and then, and then so, but here's the issue. So, so basically this was a text which had the Hebrew and the Latin and the Greek Septuagint, which was a translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. Okay. And then the New Testament had the Latin and the Greek. So polyglot is basically multiple languages on the same page is what polyglot means. But the key here, right? And when was that published? Um, 1514. The first printed Greek New Testament came from the press as part of a polyglot Bible. Okay, so 1514. So now we're in 1514. So the, the, the Gutenberg Bible, Bible was 14. Let me write this down. Um, so the Greek is 14. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm, I'm on, on my handy dandy whiteboard here. If you're, if you're watching, trying to, okay, 14. Oh God, that's way too thin. Okay. 1450 was the Gutenberg Bible. Okay. Then we have 1514 is the Complutensian polyglot okay so we're just tra tracing the history now the complutentian polyglot is the first thing that was printed that had the greek so we're let's just talk about the greek had the greek new testament print so remember where was where were where would you have found this before before the printing press how would you go look at the greek new testament the actual greek language and the copies of the greek you'd have to go to a library you'd have to go to a church you'd have to go to rome and examine the manuscripts. Well, let's take those manuscripts and put them into a book. Well, how do you do that? Well, you can't, you, you have to 
edit it. This is the key. You have to go through and transcribe and take that Greek new manuscript and put it into a typeset and put it on the plate in order to print the Bible. And that's where we start getting into textual criticism. Now, as Metzger says here, what Greek manuscripts lie behind the text of the Complutense in New Testament has never been satisfactorily ascertained. Okay, so let's just, we'll, we'll just make that comment. So there's a Greek, this is the first printed edition. I'm sorry, my, my microphone is falling. I got to fix this later. My microphone is falling off of, off of the stand. I'm sorry. Hope it doesn't fall. Good thing this isn't alive. Okay. So the Complutensian polyglot, they didn't know what, what, what the Greek manuscripts were. Okay. So that's the only point to make there. Okay. So let's, though the Complutent, okay, so now we're just going to do some reading here from, from Metzger. Though the Complutensian text was the first Greek New Testament to be printed, the first Greek New Testament to be published, that is put on the market, was the edition prepared by the famous Dutch scholar and humanist Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam. So that's an important name that you need to learn. Desiderius Erasmus. Okay, his dates are born in 1469, died in 1536, okay, Erasmus. Okay, so he's very important. It cannot be determined exactly when Erasmus had decided to prepare an edition of the Greek Testament, but on a visit to ba Basel in August 1514, he discussed, probably not for the first time, the possibility of such a volume with a well-known publisher, Johann Froben. Their negotiations seemed to have been broken off for a time, but were resumed in April 1515, while Erasmus was on a visit to the University of Cambridge. It was then that Froben importuned him through a mutual friend, Betus Rahanus, to undertake immediately an edition of the New Testament. Doubtless, Froben had heard of the forthcoming Spanish polyglot Bible, and, sensing that the market was ready for an edition of the Greek New Testament, wished to capitalize upon the demand before Eximenes' work would be finished and authorized for publication. So it's interesting, right? The, the free market capitalism is still uh, one of the pressures here to get Erasmus to uh, get an edition of the Greek New Testament on the market. So there's a financial profit motive. Interesting. Froben's proposal, which was accompanied by a promise to pay Erasmus as much as anyone else might for such a job, apparently came at an opportune moment. Going to Basel again in June, July 1515, Erasmus hoped to find Greek manuscripts sufficiently good to be sent to the printer as copy to be set up and type along with his own Latin translation, on which he had been working intermittently for several years. To his vexation, the only manuscripts available on the spur of the moment required a certain amount of correcting before they could be used as a printer's copy. And James White brings this up in the debate. Erasmus did not have access to the number of manuscripts that we have today. He just didn't. So when, and we'll get into that, how many he actually had. But in this first edition of Erasmus's Greek New Testament that he published, he did not have enough copies to satisfactorily do what he wanted to do. The printing began on 2nd of October, 1515. And in a remarkably short time, 1st of March, 1516, the entire edition was finished, a large folio volume of about 1,000 pages, which, as Erasmus himself declared later, was precipitated rather than edited. So <laughs> Erasmus had a publishing deadline. Okay, so what's the first edition? The first edition of Erasmus's Greek New Testament, which was compiled by whatever manuscripts he found at the library in Basel, okay, Switzerland. And he print and, it, and he's he's admitting it was rushed. It was a rushed edition. Is March of fifteen sixteen. So I'm writing the timeline here. If you're listening, March of fifteen sixteen is the first edition. And remember, if you're a beginner, what did, what did, what did Erasmus do? He went, because we had the Latin Vulgate, right? The Latin Vulgate is the printed text that you can get an entire volume of by this time, 15, 15, 15, 14. Well, there was a desire, well, what's the Greek behind the Latin Vulgate? Well, what you had to do is you had to go find the manuscripts. And then, of course, there were, a, there was a complete copy, okay, Codex um, Vaticanus that is in Rome and we'll, we'll talk about his consultation of that in a moment okay but what he was doing is he had to get the manuscripts the copies of the Greek that have been passed down over the generations and take those 
and put them into a form where they could be put on a plate and stamped on a page, the printing press, and put into a book. Like that, that's the task that Erasmus was trying to complete. Um, owing to the haste in production, the volume contains hundreds of typographical errors. In fact, Scrivener once declared, it is in that respect the most faulty book I know. Since Erasmus could not find a manuscript which contained the entire Greek Testament, he utilized several for various parts of the New Testament. For most of the text, he relied on two rather inferior manuscripts from a monastic library at Basel, one of the Gospels and one of Acts and Epistles, both dating from about the 12th century. So, very important. So in this edition... He had two manuscripts to work from, okay? He had two manuscripts um, for, for, most of the, for most of the text. He had two inferior manuscripts. Now, that's what's going to be challenged. What, what do you mean inferior? Okay, that's a loaded term, right? Why, why were these inferior manuscripts? And when were they from? They were from the 12th century, okay? So this first edition, two manuscripts he was working from, okay? Erasmus compared them with two or three others of the same books and entered occasional corrections for the printer in the margins or between the lines of the Greek script. For the book of Revelation, he had but one manuscript dating from the 12th century, which he had borrowed from his friend Aruchlin. Unfortunately, this manuscript lacked the final leaf, which had contained the last six verses of the book. For these verses, as well as a few other passages throughout the book, were Greek texts of the Apocalypse and the adjoining Greek commentary with which a manuscript was supplied are so mixed up as to be almost indistinguishable. Erasmus depended upon the Latin Vulgate, translating this text into Greek. As will be expected from such a procedure, here and there in Erasmus' self-made Greek text are readings, which, this is important, which have never been found in any known Greek manuscript, but which are still perpetuated today in printings of the so-called Textus Receptus of the Greek New Testament. So, this is what Erasmus did. He had these several manuscripts that he worked from to produce this first edition. And he, he didn't even have the final leaf of the book of Revelation. So he took the Latin Vulgate and he back translated it into, into Greek. And there are verses there that are still in this, so in this copy. Now, so here's, here's where the debate between Dr. White and Dr. Riddle come down. This we're reading about with Erasmus and the choices he's making and the things he's doing. Dr. Riddle and his group will end up arguing, and, and Dr. White pushes Dr. Riddle to basically admit this, that God, God's providence, God is supernaturally superintending what Erasmus is doing right here. So Erasmus begins it. So God ordained in his providence, this man Erasmus, to begin a process which started in March, which in, in 1515, 1516, when Erasmus started doing this work, which this process, and we'll go through this history because it's important to know, this process will end up, I'm, gonna, I'm just drawing an arrow here, and we're going to follow this arrow, and this arrow is going to go all the way till we get to what? What becomes known as the Textus Receptus, the received text. That's what it means in Latin. And this was, and we'll see, where does Textus Receptus come from? It's a marketing pitch that by this edition, because it's the received text. Well, it was received by no one. There was no church council or anyone that says this particular edition is the received text. It was just a marketing thing. So let's continue. So that's what Je Dr. Real is talking about. And what he's saying is this process that started with Erasmus and ended with a man named Beza, with several in between, this process of looking at Greek manuscripts, comparing them with one another, creating a text that can be printed on a printing press and handed out and sold in a book form. That process that started with Erasmus in 1515 and went all the way to this edition called the Texas Receptus, which is like, what, 70, 80 years later, that process was superintended by God so that what happens at the end, by the time we get to the end of it, that is what Paul originally wrote. That is what Mark originally wrote. That is what Matthew originally wrote. So by the time this is complete, this process, we don't really need to know what the manuscripts said in the past because we have this process that unfolded under the providential hand of God. And what Dr. James White is arguing is, if this is your view, 
then you have removed the text of the New Testament from the historical process. And you have basically made a presupposition that says, God did it, that settles it, and then James White is right. Then you, you there's no, well, then why, why bother debating anyone else about their text and the historicity of their text? Because you're just saying, well, listen, this is the text. God did it. It settles it. Uh, don't need to, don't need to think, don't need to analyze. And then what happens is, and then we'll see, we'll see. Because Metzger comes along and he says, listen, the Texas Receptus gained this superiority, but it was illegitimate because it was based on inferior manuscripts, according to him. And like I said, that's a loaded question. How do you determine what's a better manuscript and what's not a better manuscript? Okay, let's continue. Even in other parts of the New Testament, Erasmus occasionally introduced into his Greek text material taken from the Latin Vulgate. Thus, in Acts 9.6, the question of which Paul asked at the time of his conversion on the Damascus Road, and he trembling and astonished, Lord, what will it have me to do, was frankly interpolated by Erasmus from the Latin Vulgate. This addition, which is found in no Greek manuscript at this passage, though it appears in the parallel account of Acts 22.10, became a part of the Texas Receptus from which the King James Version was made in 1611. And by the way, the King James translators depended primarily, although I'm pretty sure I'm not right, uh, they had other manuscripts they worked with as well. It wasn't exclusively the Texas Receptus, but primarily this whole process, that's what the King James translators used to translate the into English, the 1611 King James Version. The reception accorded Erasmus, Erasmus's edition, the first published Greek New Testament, was mixed. On the one hand, it found many purchasers throughout Europe. Within three years, a second edition was called for, and a total number of copies of the 1516 and 1519 edition amounted to 3,300. So there was 3,300 of these first two editions. There was a 1516 edition. Wait, hold on. The second edition I'm writing here was 1519. So now we're in the second edition of Erasmus in his Greek New Testament. On the other hand, in certain circles, Erasmus's work was received with suspicion and even outright hostility. His elegant Latin translation, differing in many respects from the wording of Jerome's Vulgate, was regarded as presumptuous, a presumptuous innovation. Particularly objectionable were the brief annotations in which Erasmus sought to justify his translation. He included among the philological notes a few cau caustic comments aimed at the corrupt lives of many of the priests. <laughs> in the words of J.A. Frode, the clergy's skins were, were tender from long impunity. They shrieked from pulpit and platform and made Europe ring with their clamor. As a result, universities, Cambridge and Oxford among them, forbade students to read Erasmus's writings or booksellers to sell them. <laughs> so... Interesting, right? So Dr. James White here is being criticized by Dr. Riddle and his group um, for tinkering with the text, for, for bringing crit modern enlightenment criticism into the text. And we have our received text. We have the Textus Receptus of the Reformation. We have the King James Version and all these modern versions and their eclectic, critical enlightenment text. They, they're, 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 they're corrupting the word of God. They're tanker, tampering with the word of God. Guess who also got uh, accused of that? Oh, Erasmus did. Interesting, right? Erasmus did. Okay, we continue. Among the criticisms leveled at Erasmus, one of the most serious appeared to be the charge of St uh, Stunica, one of the editors of I Imenenes, Complutensi, and Polyglot, that his text lacked part of the final lacked part of the final chapter of 1 John, namely the Trinitarian statement concerning the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness on earth. 1 John 5, 7 to 8, King James Version. So I'll write that up here. That's a very, 1 John 5, 7. So 1 John 5, 7. Okay. And look that up if you, if you like. So, but that's what the text says. So Erasmus's this is very important. Erasmus did not put that verse in his first two editions of the Greek. He, didn't, he just left it out. He didn't put it in. Erasmus replied. So that was a criticism. So the, the guy that did the Complutensi and Polyglot, the one back here, he had it in his. But Erasmus removed it. Erasmus replied that he had not found any Greek manuscript containing these words, though he had in the meanwhile examined several others 
besides those on which he relied when first preparing his text. In an unguarded moment, Erasmus promised that he would insert the comma Johannium. So if, you, if you, you'll hear them talk about this, what's the comma Johannium? That's just a fancy term for First John 5, 7, and 8, where it says there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Okay. So if you look at your modern versions, English Standard, New American Standard, NIV, that's not in there. I mean, it's, there'll, there'll be a notation that'll say it, it's, it's not in the earliest manuscripts. In an unguarded moment, Erasmus promised that he would insert the comma Johannium, as it is called, in future editions of if a single Greek manuscript could be found that contained the passage. At length, such a copy was found, or was made to order. As it now appears, the Greek manuscript had probably been written in Oxford about 1520 by a Franciscan friar named Froy, or Roy, who took the disputed words from the Latin Vulgate. Erasmus stood by his promise and inserted the passage in his third edition, but he indicates in a lengthy footnote his suspicion that the manuscript had been prepared expressly in order to confute him. <laughs> so this is good stuff. This is good history, right? So, so Erasmus leaves the verse out because he can't find it in any Greek manuscript, and he's criticized for it. And he's like, listen, if you can show me one Greek manuscript that has it, I'll put it in the next edition. And someone forged a Greek manuscript. And I believe that that manuscript, I can't remember the name of it. See, this is where I'm an intermediate. I'm not an expert. Doc, I've heard Dr. White mention it multiple times. I think he even went and saw it. I even think he, it's in, I don't know where, it's in a library over in Europe somewhere. He went and saw it and he examined it himself. It is the made to order copy of a Greek manuscript that has 1 John 5, 7. Isn't that pretty cool? It was forged to put it in there. <laughs> Among the thousands of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament examined since the time of Erasmus, only three others are known to contain this spurious passage. They are Gregory 88, a 12th century manuscript that has the comma written in the margin in a 17th century hand. Interesting, right? So it's a manuscript that is, was originally from the 12th century, but someone 500 years later wrote it into the margin. Tischendorf Omega 110, is that what it says? I think that's what it says, which is a 16th century manuscript copy of the Complutensian Polyglot Greek text. So this is a, it's just a copy of the Comp Complutensian Polyglot. And Gregory 629 dating from the 14th, or as Rickenbach has argued, from the later half of the 16th century. So that's the only evidence we have of 1 John 5.7. There's no Greek manuscript evidence of 1 John 5, 7 for 1,500 years, right? I mean, because even these ones that are, say, it's from 1,200, is suspicious. It seems like someone wrote it in. The oldest known citation of the comma is in a 4th century Latin treatise entitled Liber Apollodeticus, chapter 4, attributed to either Priscillian or his follower, Bishop Inst Instantius of Spain. The comma probably originated as a piece of allegorical exegesis of the three witnesses and may have been written in a marginal gloss in a Latin manuscript of 1 John once it was taken into the old text of the old Latin Bible during the 5th century. The passage does not appear in manuscripts of the Latin Vulgate before about A.D. 800. That's interesting. Even the Latin Vulgate doesn't have it until A.D. 800. In view of its inclusion into the Clementine edition of the Latin Vulgate, 1592, in 1897, the Holy Office in Rome, a high ecclesiastical congregation, made an authoritative pronouncement, approved and confirmed by Pope Leo XIII, that it is not safe to deny that this verse is an authentic part of St. John's epistle. Modern Roman Catholic scholars, however, recognize that the words do not belong in the Greek te Testament. For example, the four bilingual editions of the New Testament that were edited by Bover, Merck, editions of the uh, Bover, Merck, Noli, and Vogels include the words as part of the Vulgate text approved by the Council of Trent, but reject them from the Greek text that faces the Latin of the opposite page. So, even the Roman Catholics, who hold the Latin Vulgate in such high regard, recognize that 1 John 5, 7 is not original. So this is just, you know, this is just a little a side issue of like, this is one of the big topics of, you know. So, so what is textual criticism? It's going back to the Greek texts that underlie the other translations, the Latin Vulgate, and in this case, the English translations of the King James Bible moving forward. And how do we reconstruct a text? Now, Erasmus is reconstructing a text, as we read. He's taking manuscripts, he's comparing them, and then he's turning it into, and this is why this printing press issue I keep pushing, because of what he... There's no reason for him to do this unless the printing press. And there's a capitalistic thing, a market pressure, Erasmus, you need to get this edition out. Okay, So we, what we're doing is we're taking these Greek manuscripts and 
what we are doing is we are comparing and contrasting them and we are putting together a text that can be put on a plate which can be typeset and printed on a page and books can be produced in this case 3300 of them between 1516 and 1519 and sold on the market we continue subsequently Erasmus issued a fourth wait a fourth and definitive edition wait which where did I miss the third edition where did I miss the third edition uh, it's third at 1522 I'm sorry so his third edition is 1522 and the third has the comma Johannium in it first John 5 7 now we have his fourth edition and Metzger says this is his author his definitive edition Subsequently, Erasmus issued a fourth and definitive edition, 1527, five years later. So the fourth edition of Erasmus is 1527, okay, which contains the Greek, which contains the text of the New Testament in three parallel columns: the Greek, the Latin Vulgate, and Erasmus's own Latin version. He had seen Eximenes' polyglot Bible shortly after the publication of his own third edition in 1522 and wisely decided to avail himself of its generally superior text and the improvement of his own. In the book of Revelation, for example, he altered his fourth edition in about 90 passages on the basis of the Complutensian text. A fifth edition, which appeared in 1535, discarded the Latin Vulgate, but differs very little from the fourth as regard to the Greek text. So then, his fifth edition of Erasmus here... His fifth edition is 1535. So that's very interesting. So that's why this Complutensian polyglot is important. So remember, Metzger said it's disputed by historians what lies behind the Greek text of the Complutensian polyglot, which is the first printed edition of the Greek text. But what he's saying is, in the fourth and fifth, in the fourth edition, remember what Erasmus did was in the Book of Revelation, for example, he did not have manuscripts for the last part of the book of Revelation. So what he did was he back translated from Latin. Well, in his fourth edition, he corrected that. And he used the Complutensian polyglot Greek text and worked from that to translate, to, to compile and edit his Greek New Testament. Very interesting. So by 1535, he has his fifth edition. Okay. And then, um, thus, the text of Erasmus' Greek New Testament rests upon a half dozen minuscule manuscripts. Okay, so this edition, there's, how, there's a half of dozen minuscule manuscripts. The oldest and best of these manuscripts, Codex 1, yeah, Codex 1, a minuscule of the 10th century, which agrees often with the earlier un unsealed text. Now, what's, there, there's some technical terms. So, minuscule, it's a, it's a, it's a type of font. So the minuscule text, that's what this is. So it's got capital letters and lowercase letters, right? So that's, so I, I can show it to you here. Oh, I lost my place in the book, but uh, if you can see it there, that is minuscule text, okay? Um, unsealed text, let me see if I have, it. I'm sure Metzger has it in here. I should have been prepared for that, I'm sorry. Um, what I can give you, actually, I can give you an example of, of it on James White. Behind James White is unsealed text. Let me widescreen this all the way for you. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Could anything be discovered? Oh, 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 oh. Sorry, started James White again. Um, that's uns unsealed text. It's all capital letters, no lowercase, no punctuation, no spaces. That's how the Bible was originally written. Interesting, right? In our day. So let me slide this back over. What's my time? We might almost already be out of time. Wow, 43 minutes. Yeah, I'm, I got I got a couple more minutes and I got to get going. Let me So, uh, let me go back to where was I? Um, cuz we're not even close to getting through this chapter. Ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. So there's half a dozen minuscule manuscripts. So that's the ones with the, the, low, the lower case, the, the more modern script. Um, the oldest and best is a 10th century, which agrees with the earlier unsealed text he, he used least because he was afraid of its supposedly erratic text. So he didn't, he, he stayed away from the earlier text. Okay? Erasmus's text is inferior in critical value to the Complutensian. 
yet because it was the he was the, it was the first one on the market and was available in a cheaper and more convenient form, it attained much wider circulation and exercised a far greater influence than its rival, which had been in preparation from 1502 to 1514. In addition to Erasmus's five editions mentioned above, more than 30 unauthorized reprints are said to have appeared at Venice, Strasbourg, Basel, Paris, and in other places. So, so the the Complutensian polyglot. And I don't know the textual history of it, and I'm sure it's been studied and compared to earlier texts in the Papyri and Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, I should do a study on that. But according to Metzger, the Complutensian Polyglot is a superior text to Erasmus's. <laughs> but Erasmus has gained wider um, popularity because it was on the market first and because it was cheaper, and because he had marketing people selling it. And he had publishers trying to make money off of it. So it gained wide uh, wide uh, reading. And, it, and then it was there was unauthorized reprints. Which that's interesting too, right? You got, you know, I don't know what copyright laws were back then. Pretty sure there weren't any. Um, anyway. Okay, one, more, one or two more paragraphs, and then we got to call this episode to a close. Uh, this is going to be a multi-part series. We haven't even really looked at the debate. I just did that to, to whet your appetite here and let you you know you we're we're talking about the the latest and greatest the, the new the new craze going on on social media and the reformed apologist world right now anyway subsequent editors though making a number of alterations in Erasmus's text essentially reproduced this debased form of the Greek Testament having secured an undeserved preeminence which came to be called the Texas Receptus of the New Testament resisted for 400 years all scholarly efforts to displace it in favor of an earlier and more accurate text. The highlights of this history are as follows. So that's the whole thing. So Dr. Riddle and the men who are from what's called the confessional text position or the Texas Receptus only position or TR only for short, they are part of that belief that the Texas Receptus is a superior text, not only... But see, here's the thing. Dr. Riddle takes it a step further. Not only is the Texas Receptus a superior text of the Greek New Testament and how we, and it is a providentially ordered and inspired text. So the choices that Erasmus made and the decisions he made that went all, and we haven't got up to the whole history of it. We still have a whole history to read about this, Texas Receptus. Erasmus was just the first person to, he was the, or the the one who broke the ground on it, and then his work was picked up by later men, which which w went to Beza. But they teach that it was providentially inspired, so that what we have, regardless of the manuscripts, the manuscripts are irrelevant in a certain level. The actual manuscripts, the earliest and best manuscripts, the discoveries that were made, and we'll read about. Um, you know, it's an interesting story on how. Codex Sinatic Sinaiticus was discovered, a complete copy of the Bible that was in a monastery, St. Catherine's Monastery, and the, that the monks had, and they had it stashed away. Um, and the, the man that discovered it and how they got it out of there because the monks didn't want him to have it, it was, it was a very interesting story. Um, these older copies of the Bible that we have discovered in the last hundred years, which Dr. Riddle and his group view with extreme suspicion, um, they think this is a corruption, this is the academy, this is the enlightenment, this is the attack upon the text of scripture, where Dr. White's saying, no, this is the scholarly work to get back to the earliest copies of the Bible that are out there so we can find what the original apostles wrote. That's the issue. So we'll start there. We'll stop there. Because... Um, well, then we get into Stephanus, and that's that's the next text. Um, but anyway, that is what we have. Uh, let's listen to Doctor. Let's uh, let's close out with Doctor White's next question. That would in any way lead you to not believe. Um, printings of the TR from the Reformation era as the standard for what scripture is, the Protestant standard for scripture. Could anything be discovered in our day that would in any way 
lead you to not believe that verses 9 through 20 of Mark chapter 16 are the inspired word of God and uh, have been providentially preserved? I do not believe that anything will be discovered that will invalidate the authenticity and originality of Mark 16, 9 through 20. That wasn't my question, of course. You changed my question. My question was, could anything be discovered? Could any amount of information at all ever be discovered that would change your understanding that verses 9 through 20 are absolutely inspired and inerrant and are in fact representative of the autograph? Not, not you don't believe that something will. Could anything be discovered? Again, I think I answered it. I think I answered it from my framework and perspective. You might not like the answer, but I said I do not think anything will be uncovered that will ultimately deny the authenticity. So here's here's what's going on. We'll close with this. So what Dr. Way is trying to get Dr. Riddle to see is that because he says the Textus Receptus, which we're starting to learn about, and this process that Erasmus started and ends with Beza, and you heard Dr. Riddle in his previous answer, we, we believe that the autograph, the original text, is, was providentially ordered and recovered during the time of the Reformation because it was this providential time in church history, and it culminated in the Textus Receptus. That's the text. And that text includes the long grinding of Mark. So the Textus Receptus has Mark chapter 16, 9 and following in it. And Dr. White's saying, well, what if we discovered, you know, and there, you know, and it, the bottom line is we have tons of manuscripts uh, that don't have the long grinding of Mark. It's just not there. It doesn't exist there. But he's saying, is there any evidence that I could show you from history, another manuscript, manuscripts of copies of Mark that would change your mind on it? And he won't, he, he can't say, yes. If there was a manuscript discovered, I would take that evidence into consideration and consider it. He said he can't answer that in the affirmative. Why? Because in his view, the Texas Receptus has been inspired by God. So this process that started with Erasmus and then with Beza was superintended by God. It was an act. It was a process of inspiration. It was a process that is inspired by God. And that process is complete and it's closed and it's a closed canon. And, and it's just like the canon is closed, 66 books of the Bible, the text of the New Testament is closed because of the Reformation period. And that's why they'll conflate canon and text in, in this movement. Well, we haven't even gotten into that yet. So we'll, we'll stop here for this part. I hope this was helpful. I hope this history is helpful to you because it's been helpful to me as I try to wade through these issues. These are complicated issues that most Christians are totally unfamiliar with, even most seminarians. I'm a seminarian. I didn't learn this stuff in seminary, really. That, that we need to learn to be uh, good um, defenders of God's truth. So thanks for joining me today and apologize from the attic. Thank you and God bless. You.